I'm Alice Jacobs from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm here at AHA Science News with Dr. Elliot Antman, also from Boston, Massachusetts, and Dr. John Spertus from Kansas City, Missouri. And we just stepped out of the late-breaking trial that presented the ischemia trials, which were actually beautifully presented and extremely well-received. So Dr. Antman, Elliot, could you set the stage for us? What is the um, background, the evidence, why was this question so important? Thank you, Alice. This, this was a very important trial. It asked a very important question that's been brewing for over three decades. How should we manage a patient with stable ischemic heart disease and moderate to severe ischemia detected on an exercise test? There have been conflicting results uh, through the last several decades, some suggesting that it was very important that we move to an early invasive strategy and others indicating that optimal medical therapy might be adequate uh, to manage such a patient. So we were really in a state of community equipoise. Optimal medical therapy, which in the past was largely anti-anginal, now includes disease-modifying components such as aggressive lowering of LDL cholesterol and antithrombotic therapies. And of course, PCI has improved with the advances in stents. Cabbage has improved with greater use of the lima graft and much more arterial anastomoses. So the ischemia research platform had several components to it. Uh, the main outcome trial, the quality of life trial, and a very important discussion of patients who are very challenging to manage, those with chronic kidney disease. So uh, let's hear what the main trial results show. So Ellie, you know, I would just I say, despite the state of equipoise, why this was also so important is I think there is residual angst in the community about not moving forward with the invasive strategy in patients with moderate to severe ischemia because of the fear that you're exposing this patient population to adverse outcomes. Yeah, a, a very good point, and we should emphasize that there really was a conservative strategy compared with an invasive strategy. The conservative strategy patients were allowed to go to catheterization and revascularization uh, if their symptoms warranted uh, that during the course uh, of follow-up in the trial. I, I might add also that, um, you know, I, I think the community at large has felt that doing revascularization does have some benefit. What that relative risk reduction is, we were never quite certain from the trials, but we felt it would be greatest in the patients who had the highest ischemic burden, who had the highest risk of dying, the highest risk of having a heart attack. And so, you know, we preferentially really didn't enroll those patients in some of the trials that have been testing revascularization strategies in the past. What was really nice about this trial, I think, that sets it apart is most trials would um, randomize on the table. And if you felt that the patient had a particularly honorary looking coronary anatomy and you weren't comfortable letting them have a 50-50 chance of medical therapy, you wouldn't do that. Instead, what ischemia did is said, before we even define the coronary anatomy on a cath, and we have identified a high risk patients because they have a lot of ischemia on their myocardium, that's when we'll randomize. And what's nice about that is now that we have the results, we can fit this back into practice before the patients go to the cath lab, as opposed to, you know, had we randomized on the cath lab, then pulling them off the table, which is not a very patient-centered thing to do to discuss treatment options. So I think that's an important advantage. A very, and also an important point, because it takes away that bias. And I think that the bias was because it's intuitive. If you fix the blockage, if you take it away, you're going to feel better, right? Isn't, and, but I think um, Elliot's point is that the meds now are not just symptom relieving, but they're disease modifying. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw such low event rates. That's because I think the um, sites were very experienced, but perhaps also because medical therapy is so As much advanced. better. Yes. I that, think there's uh, no question, both medical and, and revascularization techniques. I mean, the second generation stents and third generation stents now are much more durable and benefit and and uh, you know it's but it's nice to have these trials periodically to update I mean you know to rely I mean we still rely on uh, CAS for defining left main I mean you know there was none of the th new advances we're talking about now back then we weren't even using lemas so you know it's a really interesting medicine changes we get new techniques and strategies and we hate to do these trials because they're so expensive but in fact they could have well. huge impact on how we care yeah. for our patients let's make sure the audience knows what we found here so in john history. tell us the results 
So, um, so the results, the uh, primary, there, there were some controversy about the primary endpoints. There was originally hoped to be uh, enough patients enrolled to just look at death in MI. The endpoint was expanded per the protocol, the pre-specified protocol, to what was originally funded by NIH, which was a five-component protocol. But the bottom line is neither made a difference, that the, um, the events added to death in MI were very rare because patients were managed so well. And, um, you know, there was absolutely no difference in death in uh, uh, out to four plus years of follow-up with completely overlapping curves. Um, and the death rate was about 14% at the end of follow-up. Then the uh, MI rate is what's going to create a lot of controversy and discussion. Early on, for the first two years, there was a greater risk of myocardial infarction, primarily due to periprocedural infarcts in the invasive arm and it was lower in the conservative arm. But at two years, the curves crossed and there were more spontaneous MIs in the, invasive, in the uh, conservatively treated patients and fewer in the um, invasively treated patients. And so there was a, a round of applause for the idea of extending further. I, I would say that we saw divergent mortality curves in courage, and when we extended it to 15 years, they came together. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen in ischemia. I think we do have to do that follow-up. But the real story out for the first four years, in my mind, seems to be that there really is no death in difference in clinical events between the groups, but there's a marked benefit in terms of patient symptoms, function, and quality of life. And that was a key secondary out outcome of the trial. It was planned from the get-go. In each clinic visit, we did a brief quality of life assessment that really focused on the burden of angina, its impact on patients' physical limitation and quality of life. And we summarized that with the Seattle Angina Questionnaire Summary Score. And really what we found, and we did an analysis that given this data, how confident are we that there's a benefit with an invasive strategy, and we were 100% confident. I mean, the, the curves were nowhere near equipoise. And what's really interesting is that benefit was seen not only sort of three months after randomization, but out to three years after randomization. And, and there was no real benefit if they had no angiot baseline. So we do do a lot of, at least in my practice, we do a lot of revascularization in patients who are asymptomatic because they have a lot of ischemia and we think they're at high risk of death MI. Now, in light of ischemia, we know that we're not going to prevent death in MI. We are not going to improve their angina if they're asymptomatic. And so what we really need to do is focus on aggressive disease modifying and lifestyle behavioral changes so that we can really optimize their long-term outcomes. The other thing I thought was very important about the anal analyses that you did was that you can predict based on your baseline angina what your symptom improvement will be. And in this era of shared decision making, we can really customize it to the individual patient as to tell them the risks and benefits of each strategy. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think we, uh, you know, it's incumbent on us as investigators in the trial to start to build user-friendly tools. And I think we need to really think through how do we create the infrastructure to allow that shared decision making to occur. I mean, I personally believe that, you know, payers ought to really pay a substantial amount for those because those are complex decisions with lots of trade-offs. It takes time to implement and individualize the evidence from ischemia to an individual patient. And we somehow have to come up with a strategy that allows us to really tailor our treatment to the preferences of the patient, not because now that we know we're not really preventing deaths, their desires become incredibly important to us. And it also helps with the adherence, which is another yes. take home point. So Very Elliot, important. what do you think the take home points are? For me, the take home point was that there's a tremendous benefit in adhering to optimal medical therapy. And there were questions that came in from the social media platform during the session, which underscored how difficult it is to actually get patients to truly adhere to optimal medical therapy. But Even we, in the confines of a, of a trial. trial. Uh, but it is very, very important to do. Uh, and we, we need to understand that the, the hard endpoints that you enumerated are not really going to be changed by an early invasive strategy. I was very impressed with the relief of angina and I uh, was impressed with the fact that the more angina a patient had, uh, the better they yeah. did with the early invasive strategy. So I am looking forward to receiving one of those <laughs> tools 
to facilitate that shared decision-making discussion because it's so vitally important. I agree. Um, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to increase compliance in the medical community. You know, working in a safety net hospital where patients are homeless, speak multiple languages, it's really, really challenging. The Heart Association is actually has this guideline transformation optimization initiative. They're working in social determinants of health so that we can really get the benefits out of these life-saving guideline recommended therapies to all our patients and, you know, in all communities. I think we owe a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude and congratulations to Dr. Hockman, Dr. Marin, the co-PIs and Dr. Spertus for the quality of life presentations. The CKD patients we didn't talk about yet. Perhaps you could give us a... So, um, so uh, Sri Paul Bangalore was the... the P so there's no question that uh, Judy and David were sort of remarkable. I mean, this was a decade marriage that they had trying to pull this thing through, it, it and it was... was beautifully designed, beautifully implemented, and meticulously managed. Absolutely. So to all of them. And, and, and Sri Paul uh, Bangalore had the same passion for trying to fill the complete void in knowledge and evidence in patients with end-stage uh, kidney disease or severe CKD. And so he randomized patients uh, uh, 777 of them to an invasive or conservative strategy. There was no pre-procedural CCTA, of course, and so um, some of the patients ended up without, you know, disease, but a lot had a uh, high burden of disease. And, um, you know, there was a very high mortality rate, 36% yeah. at three years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we found no evidence of a benefit from um, an invasive strategy on, on death or MI. Um, there was a, 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 a surprisingly a non-periprocedural related increase in strokes over time and in dialysis rates over time is very statistically significant and not yet sort of understood um, and and so um, and in, in both trials I should say they did a, a fabulous job of minimizing crossover really separating the arms which worked very well and and Sri Paul did the same um, there was a lower rate of revascularization in the CKD arm um, but, you know, there was no benefit of invasive strategy in clinical events. And in contrast to the very large quality of life benefit we saw in the main trial from an invasive approach, we did not see that in the CKD population. Well, probably because they are sick, right? They're going to dialysis. They're not that active. You know? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think that, um, you know, there was a hint in the more symptomatic patients of a transient benefit, but I think none of us were impressed with the magnitude of that benefit, and that could have been placebo effect. We, yeah, you know, right. we really don't know how to manage it. Mean, we don't even know if a lot, the optimal medical strategy is better than nothing because those weren't in there. Everybody had optimal okay. medical therapy. So this is a very tough and vexing very problem, but I do feel that we don't need to you know, be screening them for burdens of ischemia if they're asymptomatic and rushing them if we find them to an invasive strategy, uh, which we don't do as much anyway in our practice given the periprocedural risks, but this gives but us reassurance that we're not denying them a life-saving procedure. So, so, Alice, maybe we could close with the fact that both of us have dealt with guidelines through the years. Um, what are your thoughts about how this might uh, influence the way guidelines writing committees look at the evidence? Well, I think it will be interesting to see how these data are integrated into the guidelines. As we discussed, it's not going to be a change in recommendation. It'll really be a new recommendation because they don't speak to this subset of patients. And mm -hmm. it's in such a well-conducted uh, trial with hard endpoints, I can't imagine it won't be incorporated into the guidelines, but we will see what the evidence and aggregate Do you think suggests. there'll be a difference in the guidelines based on the symptom burden of the patient, asymptomatic versus not? I would hope so, right? No, just, you know, being provocative. <laughs> I would it's hope makes, so. I think the quality of sense. life was so important in this patient-centric, you know, shared decision-making world. I can't imagine that that would be excluded. In fact, so guidelines writing committees on both sides of the Atlantic endorse the importance of this trial uh, for informing their next iteration of guidelines, so I'm sure they're going to look at it very carefully. So, Elliot, in closing, what else do we need to know from this trial? What, what are we looking for? So I think one of the most important things John already alluded to, which is the long-term follow-up, and I know that the investigators are trying very hard to get the funding for that. That's so important here. We need to see uh, what the durability is yep. of the findings. Uh, we need to understand uh, what happens in patients who got optimal revascularization. We need to compare them to patients who were able to achieve optimal medical therapy and truly have that comparison of the two optimal uh, groups. 
I agree. I think there's a huge amount of data that we have to, to yeah. learn, that we can learn from and, and form, but the number one question was, I think, answered quite definitively, and, and it's very exciting. I think it will have an impact. We agree. So thank you for joining us here thank at you. AHA Science News.